start my timer. Pastor Rob said I got three minutes. Good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us here at Bridge Church today. This is super exciting. I'm very pumped. Uh, the first picture I want to show you all is of my family. Let's see where I go back there. There is the family. That was Mother's Day this year. You've met my wife, Morgan. These are our children, Finley, Emerson, Willow, Peter, and Florence. Um, being a father is the third most important thing I've done in my life. Um, being a husband is second, and being a follower of Christ is first. I love my family. I think they're great. I've been hanging out with them for 12 years, and I plan to keep doing it. Um, Pastor Rob kind of alluded to this. I am a plumber, um, a plumbing apprentice, technically. Um, I do a lot of work for a plumbing company. I've worked there for uh, seven years now. Um, elbow deep in toilets, uh, weird basements, scary people, the whole nine yards. I've enjoyed every moment of it, even the hard parts of it. Um, and that's something to think about because we, as people, go through hardship. There are things that you are experiencing that no one else is that is difficult. And it is difficult uniquely to you. And you are the person going through it. You are the person who will get through it. Um, that's not always a great thing. <laughs> Let's be honest. Sometimes it sucks. But if we believe God is who he says he is, if we believe what the Bible says about God, you can get through it. So the question I have for you today is, do you believe God is who he says he is? Do you believe that the God in the Bible that we read about and experience is who he claims to be? When I think about that, I think about the promises of God. I think about the things that he has said in his word and in uh, speaking to us and the things that we learn from that. And it's like, is it true? If God is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, if he has all those things, that means he's the cosmic creator of the universe. When God said, let there be light in creation, he wrote the laws of physics in that moment. This is the stuff that we don't really think think about, we just think, oh, God said, let there be light. Well, what does that mean? The speed of light is created. God is the author of science. People claim that Christianity is an anti-science religion. That's nothing further from the truth. God wrote science. We, as followers of God, it is our duty to understand it. Science doesn't replace God. Science illuminates our understanding of God's creation. And I don't think that we talk about that a lot. And that's okay. We're not going to talk about it today. Uh, I just wanted to get weird right from the get-go. I told Rob, I was like, okay, Rob, I haven't preached in like 15 years. It's going to get weird. He's like, all right, man, I'm, I'm here for it. And I said, okay. And then I told John Arney before the service, I'm going to I'm going to tell you a risque joke up there. And Pastor Rob's not ready for it. And he talked me out of it. So everyone thank John for that. He's a good guy. We're blessed here at Bridge Church. We have great elders, uh, great worship team, great people in the church. The, the lifeblood of this community is full of great people, and that's y'all. And I'm excited to bring the word with y'all today. Uh, today, we are going to be in Psalms 88. When we were getting ready for this, uh, Adam asked me, he said, Paul, what, what uh theme of Psalms do you want to go over? And we talked about all the various themes, and I said, let's do lament. I can do that. Lamentations is one of my favorite books of the Bible. I like all the depressing ones. <laughs> Lamentations, Job, Ecclesiastes. Um, turns out like 50% of Psalms is in there too. It's a good time. I am pumped about it. So Psalms 88 is without a doubt the bleakest verse or chapter and verse in the Bible. Um, it, does, it, it deviates from the normal structure of the Psalms of Lament in that the normal structures of Psalms of Lament have five parts, an address to God, a complaint, a petition for help, a vow of trust, and a vow of praise. Psalms 88 throws that formula out the window. It is an address to God and a complaint. It is not a happy verse of the Bible. It is not one of those ones where if someone's feeling down, you're like, hey, you know what you need to read? Psalms 88. That's going to thank you. <laughs> Let's go to that first verse. Uh, 
I'm going to read this from my Bible, uh, the NIV. I'm going to read the prelude. The prelude is important. We're going to start learning about the context of Psalms 88 and what that means to us today. A song, a psalm of the sons of Korah for the director of music, according to, I can't say that, uh, a mascal of Heman the Ezraite. O Lord, the God who saves me, day and night I cry out before you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of trouble and my life draws near the grave. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like a man without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit and the darkest depths. You let, your wrath lies heavily upon me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken from me my closest friends. You have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, O Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do those who are dead rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, O Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, O Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I have been inflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me. The darkness is my closest friend. It ends. There's nothing. <laughs> you guys pumped yet? <laughs> like, you read that, and you're like, Wow. What did the sons of Korah do? <laughs> what what did these guys who are these guys? This is this is bleak. Who are these people? So the sons of Korah are descendants of a man named Korah. Go figure. In Numbers 16, Korah, um, they said scoot over a little bit. I guess they weren't kidding. Korah is a member of the priestly tribe. Uh, the priestly tribe was divided into three groups. Korah and his tribesmen were the janitors of the temple. They were God's uh, maintenance men, essentially. These were the guys sweeping the floors. and It was an honor. It was laid on them as an honor. And I don't know if you've ever done custodial work. It doesn't always feel like an honor, you know? You're cleaning up, you're wiping up puke, you're uh, scrubbing down toilets. It doesn't feel great. You're like, oh, wow, this is an honor, I guess. So the sons of Korah and Korah himself don't like it. They don't like their job. They want a new job. So Korah and two other men start grousing and complaining and riling people up. And, and they come before Moses and Aaron and the other Israelites, and they say, I can do Aaron's job. I should have Aaron's job. Aaron's no better than me. Who, dis who put Aaron in charge? They're questioning God's orders. They're questioning the roles that God has laid out for the tribe of Israel. And like most uh, rebellions, they didn't do it by themselves. They whipped up 250 other men and their families, and they said, we're mad at God and Aaron, and we want to do it better. So they come before Moses and Aaron, and they present their issues, and they're mad, and they're trying to, to stir up strife within the tribe. And Moses and Aaron rebuke them. And Moses and Aaron say, hey, this isn't what God wanted. This isn't what we're doing. And they continue to argue and fight with them. And this leads to God opening up the earth and swallowing the three of them whole. The earth opens, an earthquake, a rift in the earth tears open, and kills Korah and his two co-conspirators. The other 250 men are then killed by fire from heaven. And we are left in kind of the aftermath of that, and Aaron and Moses dealing with all that in the rest of the, the uh, chapter. It, it's not a happy chapter. These aren't happy things we're talking about. This is hardship. This is trauma, and this is violence. And it's, it's kind of incredible that, that this happened to begin with. These are men who have seen God's miracles unfold around them and still feel the need to argue and fight. 
that amazes me. I, I, I can't imagine ha- experiencing the presence of God, being given a role directly by God's servant, and then being like, you know what, but what if I did it? That just, that doesn't, I can't do it. I couldn't. So this isn't the end of Korah's bloodline. Uh, we know from reading this that there are sons of Korah 300 years later. So the question is, what happened to them in between them? You can understand that as his sons of Korah, this man who was killed by God in front of the entire tribe, they would face a level of ostracization. They would be outcasts. They wouldn't have any friends anymore. They would feel like they were in a pit. And their options, they had them. You don't have to stay in the tribe. You could go off on your own. They could have left, but they stuck around. Because even though they were disgraced, they still had a role given to them by God. And even though their patriarch had been killed, and then the whole bloodline named after him, this traitor, this man who had fermented rebellion against God's servants, that's who they were named after, and that's where they were sent. So for the next 300 years, you're thinking, okay, well, these guys are like the embarrassing dude that no one wants to talk about at the family reunion. This is, you know, this dark kind of note in in the tribe of Israel and the janitors of God. And you're looking at this and you're going, that doesn't sound like God. The story of the Bible is one of redemption and and sacrifice and restoration. If the gospel is what we believe it, it is God restoring us, or Christ's sacrifice on the cross, restoring us to that right relationship with God. And that is modeled time and time again in the entirety of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. When you study the Bible, there are themes that come up over and over again. The restoration, the gospel is one of them. And you see it from the beginning, and you will see it in this story. So 300 years later, the sons of Korah, as they are now known, a reference to an event that happened 300 years ago, and they're still wearing it around them like like a mantle. Their bloodline births the prophet Samuel. The prophet Samuel had a unique and and singular role in the history of Israel and that he ushered them into their first monarchy. He helped find King Saul. He helped the tribe of Israel pick King Saul at God's direction. And he helped the tribe of Israel transition from Saul to King David. This man, this prophet, had a singular important role. And 300 years prior to that, his ancestor committed heresy and blasphemy and turned against God. The next generation, Samuel's sons, that generation, became some of David's top military advisors. These were, they're not included in David's mighty men, but they're listed in the Bible as men who were brilliant uh, tacticians, men who were wise and, and valiant soldiers. The next generation, this would have been uh, Samuel's grandsons, authored 11 psalms. And these aren't like the psalms where, you know, they're not all Psalms 88, right? Some of them are used verses and words that we sing today in our own hymns, in our own messages. So this happened, let's say, 2,600 years ago. These men were killed by God, and we are singing their grandson's words, or no, their their great-great-great-grandson's words. That bloodline committed this blasphemy, and God used it to lead us to where we sing those praises today of God. We are singing the words that these men wrote thousands of years ago. Let's read Psalms 88 again. O Lord, the God who saves me, day and night I cry out before you. May my prayer come before you. Turn your ears to my cry, for my soul is full of trouble, and my life draws near the grave. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like a man without strength. I am set apart with the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no more, who are cut off from your care. You have put me in the lowest pit and the darkest depths. Your wrath lies heavily upon me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. You have taken me from my closest friends and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, O Lord, every day. I spread my hands out to you. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do those who are dead rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness and destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness, or or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, O Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. 
Why, O oh Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth I have been afflicted and close to death. I have suffered your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken my companions and loved ones from me. The darkness is my closest friend. The author of this is Heman the Ezraite, who was Samuel's grandson. This verse was written by a man whose bloodline included Korah. 300 years later, he's writing a song from the perspective of his, his, the sons of Korah. He's writing a perspective for them about what they went through. Your response to hardship determines if it is a complaint or a lament. When we were talking about what a lament means, Adam said to me, lament is a complaint, but it ends with, but I will trust in God. <clears throat> so I'd say Psalms 88 is more of a complaint. This is people who are going through something difficult and hard. But I would say that their posture and their response was a lament. These are men who are going through ostracization, uh, exclusion, trial, persecution, and they are taking it and they are making the best of it. They were still faithful to God. God killed the patriarch of their clan, and they were still faithful to him because they, re they revered God more than they revered their father. That's a hard place to be, and it's a hard position to take, and it's not difficult. Let me share a moment in my life where I, I myself was in that position. Can we go to the next slide? So, yes. Ultimate trash slayer. Uh, 14 years ago, I was dating the lovely Miss Morgan, and I was working at Office Max. <laughs> I was a printer salesman. I could tell you everything about printers, HP Office Jets. That's the only one I remember. It's been a long time. But I wanted to get married, and I knew that 10 bucks an hour wasn't going to cut it. So I started looking for a job, and I put out a lot of applications, and the only people who called me back was the garbage company. And they said, you got hands? Cool, 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 cool. Can you walk? That's awesome. Come get on the truck. Let's go. That started off seven years of me being the ultimate trash slayer. This is a picture from my first summer. Um, you can't tell it, but I've lost about 40 pounds at this point. I'd been there for about two months, and uh, every day I would hurt, and every day I would sweat, and every day I would bleed and just... I had a uh, third degree burn on my arm from the sun. I mean, it was wild stuff. Um, and I got hurt a lot at that job. I uh, <laughs> tore every ligament in an ankle. I ran into the garbage truck. I've been hit by the garbage truck. <laughs> Just pick something bad. It, it was a hard time in my life, but it was good work and I enjoyed it for a time. The longer I'd spent there, the more I began to not enjoy it, and the more I began to kind of hate it. And the, the people I worked with weren't the best, and the bosses I had weren't the best, and they were, I'd say, cruel at some times. But I knew that this is what I had to do to provide for my family. This is what I had to do that made a way for us. So I endured it. It wasn't great. Um, I would rate it as a uh, bottom 10 experience. <laughs> but I knew that God had put me there for a reason. And that I was doing his work even there. There were men I ministered to on my garbage route. There's a man named Willie. Willie was the funniest human being on the planet. He was about 70 when I worked with him. He's probably close to 85 now. And he could outwork everyone, and he wouldn't stop talking. As soon as we got off the truck, his mouth would start running, and he would talk trash to me all day and tell me I was slow and that I was old and he was young and that uh, he was the real father of Beyonce's children. And just <laughs> Willie was a hoot. He would say the craziest wild things to me. But over our friendship and relationship, I got to minister to him some really dark times. And there's another man named Jake Richards. I love Jake. He's the strongest human being on the planet. Um, doesn't look like it. He looks like a dirty Q-tip all the time. His head's fuzzy. He's just this 
ramrod, skinny dude who's just unbelievably strong. And he went through a lot of hard stuff, and we talked about it a lot. And he'd come to church, and he'd heard the gospel, and he'd experienced whatever measure of comfort I could offer through the Holy Spirit to him. And God used these moments in my life to, to show me that even though the work was hard, and I hated it, and it was killing me, I was still serving him there. Your response to hardship is seen by God. When you're going through stuff, your response is God sees it. God knows it. Whatever it is, it doesn't, you don't have to have the right response. You're all going to go through hard stuff, and you're going to scream and curse God. It happens. God doesn't exclude you from his mercy and his grace because you're experiencing something hard, because you're having a human response to it. Let's go to the next picture. So this is, Finley is about eight months old, but you can see it in my face. I'm beaten hard. Um, this was probably, this is about halfway through my time there as a garbage man. And Morgan will tell you that it was killing me. It was hard. But the thing I've asked myself when I come into hardship is if God is who he says he is, and I trust who God says he is, and I believe in God and who he says he is, am I going to be able to endure this? Am I going to be able to serve him in that? And my answer was yes. Even if it was hard, my answer was still yes. Your response to hardship answers the question if you believe God is who he says he is. And you're, and you're allowed to have emotions. You're allowed to feel bad and angry and go through hard stuff that hurts. You're allowed to, to vent to God. You're allowed to be upset and maybe even doubt him briefly. God isn't a, a bully with a magnifying glass frying you for your sins. God, the omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, infinite creator of the cosmic universe that you and I understand, knows who you are. He experiences what you are going through. If you are experiencing pain and hardship, Jesus Christ, a man who is fully God, knows that pain. What you've gone through, he understands. He's with you in that moment. If God is who he says he is, we have to trust him. Let's go to the next slide. This next picture is me four years ago. Uh, I just started the plumbing part of my Roto-Rooter journey. And uh, I'd been an apprentice for about eight months. And I was supposed to go out here with the master plumber, but he's like, you know what, Paul? You know what you're doing. Go for it. So one of our guys got a cable stuck in a pipe. And after making fun of him, I went and got it out. But I had to do a whole bunch of other work. But I would never have come to this spot if I hadn't reached another spot in my journey when I was a garbage man, where I audibly said to God in my little red car on my way home, crying from work, and I'd said, God, I hate it here. I don't want to be here, but I know you have a purpose for it. You have a plan for it, and I'm going to trust you. About a year later, our basement flooded, and Rotorooter showed up. And my wife had called them, and I wasn't there. And she goes, hey, I need your help. They've got way more questions than I have bandwidth for answering right now. So I came home. The rest is history. I've worked there the last seven years. God took me from this, this terrible place where I, it was killing me, but I was serving him. And he brought me to a different place where I could serve him in a different way. And it's because I trusted God in that moment. When you are going through hardship, your response determines whether or not you believe God is who he says he is. Now, if you believe God is who he says he is, then this meant something and, and you understood it. But if you didn't, it's probably because you're not a believer to begin with. And that's fine. I'm glad you're here today. I, I want you to be here. The gospel of Jesus Christ says that Christ died on the cross for your sins that separate you from God and that through his death and resurrection, you can know the presence of God. You can leave your life behind. You can change who you were. You can become more Christ-like. Is it a perfect process? No. It is a journey. I've been on it for 33 years. I'm not getting any better at it, it seems. <laughs> but I see God working in me, and I see God working in my family. 
And I don't know how, to, how people do it without him. I couldn't. I couldn't have done any of the things I've done in the last 15 years without God's presence in my life, comforting me, guiding me through this. When I was a garbage man, that was some of the bleakest and darkest times in my life. I felt like I was in a pit. Finley was maybe three months old, and I went an entire week without seeing her because I would go to work at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I would come home at 8 at night. And I did that for four days in a row, and I went in on that Friday, and I told my boss, I'm like, hey, I'm leaving. Like, at 3 o'clock, I'm gone, no matter what. I don't, you guys figure it out. I'm, I haven't seen my kid in five days. I won't be here after 3. See you later. He didn't like that, but whatever. <laughs> you go through hardship. You're going to experience pain. This church has had a lot of pain this last year. I'd say the last three years. Uh, tw- Rob calls 2020 the great revealer, where we saw a lot, we learned a lot, and we went through a lot. And I don't feel like it's ever really stopped since then. You go through things. Your experiences are unique to you, but they are hard. And God knows them, and God knows you. When you are experiencing hardship, when you are experiencing struggle and strife, when you are experiencing pain, uh, the injustices leveled against you, the laments to your life, their power, their weight, and all that, it all depends on your response. If you allow yourself to stay in it, you will be overwhelmed by waves. You will be crushed. But if you trust in God, God will see you through it. You will not always see what God is doing with your pain and your suffering. Uh, The sons of Korah, the physical sons of Korah, not his his bloodline, they didn't see the prophet Samuel. They didn't see the military advisors. They didn't see the 11 Psalms written by their bloodline. Are you okay with that? Are you okay with your suffering not ever making sense to you? Do you trust who God is? Do you trust who he says he is? This is hard. This is, this is the ugliest, hardest truth of Christianity, that you will not always see the purpose of your suffering. But God is good. When God looked at the whole of creation, when he was done, and God created light and time and everything we understand, God saw the beginning of time and the end of time. He looked at all of it. He saw you in that specifically, and he said, it is good. It don't feel good all the time. That's okay. God is who he says he is. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your blessings upon this church. Thank you for your gospel. Thank you for your ministry here on earth. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. We ask that you bless this church. You ask that we, I ask that you bless us as we are going through hardship and pain and suffering. I ask that you give us peace about it, even if we don't understand it. God, as we get ready to uh, do communion together, thank you for your son and his sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for what that means to us. Thank you for your gospel. In your name we pray, amen.